Good morning, Hawaii peeps. Afternoon, evening to all the rest of you good folks joining in. And for those viewing later, whatever time it may be is the right time. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii in 2022. Starting this one off whatever best way we can. And today, maybe to start things on a a more positive, hopeful, inspiring note, and maybe both sides of the picture. Uh, some thoughts on Martin Luther King Jr. His day was at the beginning of this week. We're still honoring him. And speaking of honoring, I wanted to start off by honoring Professor Randall, the winner of the Society of American Law Teachers Great Teacher Award for 2021. That is a particularly distinguished and rare honor. And it's the product of decades of preeminent teaching on race, racism, the law, and more from Professor Randall. So congratulations. Thank you very much. And actually we've got four award winners of various kinds here. Ben Davis, we know, retired professor from the University of Toledo School of Law. And Ben, have you started the spring semester at Washington and Lee? Yep, just started there. Okay, there so we'll change your caption for professor at Washington and Lee from here on out. Okay. And Tina Patterson won a number of awards this past year and has in the past as well. And David Larson, chair of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution, and the man behind the design of New York's online case resolution system, years in the works and years in the making and now up and rolling and gaining momentum. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you all for being here. Some thoughts on MLK. Any thoughts that may come to your mind on how he might look at where we are now and thoughts or words that he might have for us or you might have for us based on the learning that he made possible. Professor Randall, want to start us off? I was, uh, thank you. I was, uh, I grew up doing segregation and so I am a direct beneficiary uh, of the civil rights movement and was a uh, junior in college when MLK was killed. So I, I, I saw all of that. And what strikes, was a couple of things strikes me is one, how uh, M MLK has been neutralized by the majority and uh, both black and whites to be milder and more acceptable. It's sort of like uh, he was a spicy dish and they took all the spice out of him to make him acceptable to the general public. Uh, I think the now looking back, I didn't think this at the time, but now looking back, I think the primary difference between Malcolm X and MLK was really only their view about uh, uh, the appropriate use of violence. Uh, that they shared a lot of similar views and. I, I want to just, I've got a couple of quotes, but I'm only one to give one that he said in 1967. That was my sophomore year in college. Uh, he said, uh, whites, it must frankly be said, are not putting in a similar mass effort to re-educate themselves out of their racial ignorance. It's an aspect of their sense of superiority that the white people of America believe they have so little to learn. And I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the attempt that over the years since his death, there was attempt by progressives and by uh, minority communities to get accurate history introduced into schools, into books. 
and 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 we have a backlash to that and uh and I think that he would see what's going on as uh, a backlash to everything he tried he worked for and, and he's got another famous 1967 quote about the white backlash that's directly applicable now in fact Hannah Nicole Jones, the Pulitzer Prize winner, who was invited to give a speech on MLK Day. And there was, there are always a few who reacted against that, saying she was a discredited activist. And so the first half of her remarks were all quotes from Martin Luther King Jr., which she didn't disclose until after she had completed them. And there was a stunned silence in the group. Hey, and thank you for reminding us what a truly forceful activist he was. Hey. Yeah, if I can jump in, uh, there's Please. a quote I saw recent, uh, relatively recently in uh, when the movie uh, about uh, James Baldwin, I'm Not Your Negro came out, where it had uh, these videos of all the people he knew who were whoever they were, and they were all killed. <laughs> okay, so it was, there was King, there was uh, Malcolm X, I can't remember all, uh, Meg Evers, I think was another one. They, they were all these sort of different people, uh, activists in the black movement. But the thing that got me in that particular uh, movie was there was a quote from King where he said, uh, and I think he used it a lot more than I had seen. He said that uh, you have the right to be free and then you have the duty to be free, uh, which that duty part of it, I thought was something I hadn't really picked up on that really the, 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 the burden of, uh, it was not just one of sort of asserting rights, but the duty to live those rights and to make sure those rights happen for yourself and for those uh, uh, others who, who, who are being oppressed in, in, in both the system inside the United States and more broadly, when he went to his move with regards to militarism in the late 60s. So that has been a, a, a powerful thought from, for me of his. Um, I look at him maybe now a little differently than uh, I used to in the sense that I think more uh, sort of in the sort of 500 year vision of him. In other words, not just his life, but his life as being part of a series of lives that have been going on for many, many, many years uh, of people uh, essentially uh, fighting for or fighting against what was essentially, I guess it was in 1455 or something like that, the blessing of the perpetual enslavement of black people by the Pope at the time. Um, and this battle for 500 years of different people trying to assert uh, the human dignity of, uh, of Africans, blacks, uh, in different ways. I think of people like uh, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, who created the African Methodist Episcopal Church. They were good old Episcopalians until someone in the church said, that, could you all sit in the back up there as opposed to down on the floor? And uh, I think Richard Allen said, can we finish our prayers first? <laughs> okay. And then they finished their prayers and then they all walked out and created the African Methodist Episcopal Church because they were not going to except in the late 1700s, that kind of uh, treatment in the place of faith, okay? So, I, and I look at King as being the, this, this powerful, uh, putting a powerful request to, to us all to uh, not only make sure that we have the right, but we, we do have the duty to act, to help to make sure that everyone is free. And, uh, Obviously, that causes reactions, as we can see, even with the uh, the vote yesterday, uh, with regards to not passing the Voting Rights Act. You know, I think the thing that really struck me was apparently after it all went down, you had uh, was it fifty two, or maybe maybe only the Republicans, but fifty two of, of the senators applauded. Okay, that is the thing that strikes me in a way is that the idea of applauding after something like that uh, is just the emblematic of a kind of uh, cruelty, harshness, whatever you want to call it, 
when we know about all of the various laws that have been passed to try to restrict voting over the last year or so played out under this big lie, right? Or the, the idea that even as more evidence comes forward, not that there was a need for it, but evidence comes forward that there was nothing that was a fraud. That was it. In fact, the fraud is really starting to turn to be shown on the uh, part party part of those who are asserting that there was fraud. For example, this idea of sending false elector uh, documents saying that they were official electors from the state of Michigan, or I think New Mexico is another one, uh, that uh, were signed by people who uh, were uh, Republican electors, you know. Uh, I, I mean, I would have thought that people would have at least had a lawyer, you know, say, hey, what, you know, when somebody calls you and says, hey, why don't you, what, what should you go ahead and sign this elector thing and send it down to the National Archive and to the governor and all that stuff. Then, you know, somebody would call their friend and say, hey, what do you think about me doing this? You know, and they'd say, well, you know, that could be election fraud, you know, and you could be criminally prosecuted for that, you know. But people, you know, some didn't, but a bunch of them did. And now you've, they've got referrals, I think, by the Attorney General of Michigan, Attorney General of New Mexico to the, Fed, the feds about what is, to me, kind of a, looks like pretty fraudulent election stuff uh, as part of the really yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate your comment about the long line of people in the history because I just had to say to someone yesterday who said, a young person who on my Facebook page said something like, King done more for our people than anyone. I had posted something that wasn't 100% about King. And she said, King has done more for our people than anyone. I'm, so I'm like, King was a person of his time who was yeah. a long line of people and built upon a long line of people. And if he had come along with nothing having been done, he would have accomplished nothing. Right. That, that, that his, he is as, as significant as he is, he was only that significant because of the hundreds of years of work, racial justice work, uh, not only by all different people in all different groups, you know, the protesting their particular situation. Uh, and then for at the time King came along and he was given that authority largely because he was young and educated and people at the time thought his new face, his new voice would get people to listen in a way that they had stopped listening to the people who were activists and they were right about that. Ben, ben mentioned the fraud going on. We've got my pillow, Mike Lindell in Minnesota. So if you want to get an example of somebody putting out fraudulent and extreme positions, just listen, listen to him for a while. Um, and getting back to Chuck's question, when I think what's what's Martin Luther King Jr.'s relevance today, you know, I'm, I think it's bravery. You know, just this constant dedication to nonviolence when violent threats are being directed at him continually, death threats, um, and to be able to maintain that position of nonviolence, I think is, is still relevant today. Can we do that? Um, we have this expression rolling over in the grave. You know, I'm not sure that's the right one, but I'm thinking some tears. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if in the afterlife you can cry, I would think he'd cry a little bit because um, we're seeing right now, and we've seen this week, um, people taking his words kind of out of context. And, uh, you know, we saw it in Virginia with Youngton, um, you know, taking the famous quote, of, you know, you should not be judged by the, by the color of your skin, by the content of your character. Um, and then basically saying, we're there, um, it's time. Um, so let's not talk about any racial history or critical race theory and let's ban it in the in the elementary schools although it's never been taught in the elementary schools um so so you know it tears in the sense that you know my you know my message is not being communicated accurately and thoroughly in the way i meant it because the following language is you know whites haven't basically 
fulfill the promise to do that. And you know, much work needs to st still be done. And and it's being used in the context that we are done. And there's no reason to talk about that because that just makes us feel bad about ourselves. So let's just you know, let's just assume there's no history we have to worry about. And I think that's that's troubling. So I, I think there might be tears about that, and also tears about, um, as was already mentioned, all the voting rec all the voting restrictions that are coming, and they're coming in. You know, a lot of the bills from 2021 that weren't passed are carrying over. Um, you know, some like 88 bills carried over, tremendous number of bills, everything from, you know, limiting absentee ballots, the ballot drop boxes. It's like everything you can think of to make it hard to cast a ballot. Um, you know, even, you know, in Michigan, three bills were introduced, very restrictive last year. Uh, governor, uh, the Michigan governor, Democratic governor vetoed those three, um, but that didn't stop. A bunch of bills have been introduced uh, for the 2022 legislative session. So I think also that, that Martin Luther King Jr. would be very disappointed, discouraged by that aggressive, those aggressive attempts to, to restrict voting. Tina, I know you have some thoughts on this. I do. Um, I, I think that uh, Professor Randall, as well as Ben and David, have covered a, a lot of ground. Um, the quotes that come to my mind and really have to do with um, one is on, on the personal level. And I, this one I was sharing with a friend earlier this week, and I think it, it not only relates to Dr. King's path, but our path as leaders, as activists, and, and I'm going to read it to you. It's in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. And it's it's taking that stand um, and and saying, you know, this isn't right. This is not the way that this is not the way that law was meant to be interpreted. This is not what critical race theory means. And so standing alone, um, and knowing that you're standing alone, but you you do it just the same. I think Dr. King if he were alive today would be, like David said, um, a, a mix of emotions. Um, I, I respectfully disagree with those who, who say we, the, the Dr. King's dream has been realized. It hasn't. We're still talking about voting rights being an issue, a 52-48 vote against the Voting Rights Act that, that Congressman Lewis had put together, that package. That should be chilling for people. And for those who are silent, it, this is the wake up call. I, I, um, you know, Chuck, you and I talked about a, a podcast that another organization featured last week regarding how civil wars start. That vote should be the wake up call. This is how civil wars start. It's not the, it, it's not the farmer. It's not the the person who is getting by day to day that is at the center. It's the person who has access, who has means, who knows the laws, who knows the regulations. And it's that silence that's literally going to be the, the, the reckoning bell for all of us if, if we don't speak up. Um, the one that keeps me moving um, when I out doing work or when I think about Dr. King is injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And Staying the course, um, yeah. And sometimes staying the course means you're in a different space than your family, your friends, your colleagues. Um, but staying the course and continuing to speak up for justice. Um, I, I've had younger people tell me that things have changed, um, and in many ways they have, but in many ways they haven't. Racism is still racism. Access to justice is still access to justice, whether it's done through social media or through written form. I think one of the things that, uh, in terms of the violence things, I think Kent, people, when we draw attention to Mark, Dr. King's nonviolent stance, I don't, I have to say that, A, I'm not sure. First of all, I think people kind of misinterpret his nonviolent stance because first, I think that he was not a nonviolent person. He actually generated a lot of violence against people 
to demonstrate a point and he had to know there would be violence against them and so he was more about the using violence i think as a promotion as a as an offensive tool instead of a defensive tool but and he certainly i don't think would class riots in the category of violence. He made it clear that he viewed riot, riots as the language of the unheard, that as long as there was unjust injustice in America the, and people weren't doing things to correct that injustice, there were going to be riots. And so you can't really say, oh, look at these people rioting, they're being violent. But at the same time, not equate economic, social justice, inequities as violence. They're being defense. We already recognize, recognize self-defense in this country. So maybe they're just exercising self-defense. Then the other thing, on a personal level, and, and I, I don't at all say that this is a position that Dr. King would take, I don't think we should realize violence as a way to deal with stuff, especially oppress, because you're basically saying that if you can't change a system, you have to keep taking it because violence isn't an option. It seems to me that the reason we have a self-defense clause is because violence is an option. Someone come at you physically, violence is an option. Someone comes at you with, you know, so I don't know that I think that, I don't know when and where violence should be an option in our society for coming up against oppression. And personally, I think that we don't have enough numbers to do that, but I don't want to say that as a matter of moral value, violence should not be an option sometimes yeah yeah i yeah you know, I, so i grew up in waukegan illinois um which is a you know a community that that lower median income higher crime you know in, in the in the belt of suburbs from the wisconsin state line down to chicago you have a whole it's a really interesting socioeconomic study as you go through communities like winnetka and indian hills and kenilworth and you continue north to past the military bases up the Waukegan and North Chicago, they're very different socioeconomic communities. And, um, you know, even growing up, you know, it was, it was very clear that, that at some, at a certain point, crime was kind of a rational, a rational choice. It's like, I don't have any other choice. I don't have any other, I don't have any other way to eat or to get, to get what I need. And it wasn't an irrational choice. It was kind of like, I, I don't have any options left. Um, this is what I've got. Um, so so yeah, it's depressing to me to think that, that we've got to kind of catalog that in the list of, of, of available options. That's sad to me that that's got to be on the list. But I've never thought it was an irrational choice in the sense that um, because if we're not going to make options available, if people don't have any choices, that's, we should expect that. That's what's going to happen. So my feeling was that, oh, is that, you know, you, if you don't share, that's what you're going to get. It's, it's, yeah. it's perfectly rational choice. And so you're better off sharing. I mean, that was always kind of how I felt. So I, I just wanted to jump in on a couple of things here, if I could, which if just, uh, David kind of got me going on this, and also Tina and 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 Renelia, uh, Professor Randall did, which was uh, on this notion of getting over or forgetting the past. You know, I I'm I moved to Virginia three months ago, right? And I walk around Virginia, and the past is everywhere. I mean, it is. Uh, there's a plantation called the Berkeley Plantation where one of my great grandfathers was enslaved there. Um, I've gone out to Madison's Plantation and learned about all the history there and that the Marquis de Lafayette in 1824 was pleading with Madison to free his slaves in 1824. You know, 
there were, uh, I mean, to, to say that uh, we need to sort of forget about all that or, or you know, you, you can try to cover it up, so to speak, but it's, it's, it's in the soil. It's everywhere you're walking around in this state. And in uh, and and other states, too, I'm not saying it isn't, but it just it's kind of a, a weird thought to me that you would try to say that we've reached this perfect place when, you know, we'd have to what we'd have to do is we'd have to cancel or get rid of all or maybe cut down all the plantations. OK, that are doing business here. Uh, Williamsburg would have to disappear. All these things, Jamestown, all that would just have to disappear for us to forget about it. And that's absurd, you know. I mean, so as uh, Walt, William Faulkner said, "Oh heavens, William Faulkner, what is it? The past is never dead. You know, the, the past is always with us. It's never dead. It's always going to be there, and uh, you you can acknowledge it or not, but it's it's always there. And uh, part of the wonder or the magic is building from all that and building. You know, what is it? The more perfect." Uh, community where people do have options that are good ones to have decent work and health care and all those things that we talk about that their vote is going to be respected you know i understand there's always somebody's interest in setting people down i mean there's always a game that somebody's got an advantage of doing this that or the other um but uh, notwithstanding i think it's Sherilyn eiffel who said that with all the setbacks that have happened all over the years once the, you know the great redemption or backlash and all that and in the, particularly in the black community, there's never been a line at the end, so we gave up. <laughs> you know, it's that, oh, we don't give up. You know, people who are of, of good, uh, uh, who, people who uh, want things to progress, don't, they just don't give up. They keep doing things to make it better, even in the face of all of the nonsense that they have to deal with, you know? In until recently, well, you know, my ear, when my area of research is health uh, disparities with a focus is on African American health status. And until the last 20 or 30 years, suicide rates among Black people was so low. Uh, I mean, it was very low. Uh, and uh, and it's only <laughs> and it's kind of sad. It's only been in the last 20, 30 years as we've had more movement into the significantly more movement into the middle class that we've had an increase of suicide rate, particularly among teenage boys. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, you know, uh, but it goes to the comment that you were making. And this information about suicide and violence, and st the United States have been collecting race-based data on health for decades back into the 20s. And so if you just take the time, you can compare what was happening to black people versus what was happening to white people, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and the violence. I've always said that suicide and homicide are opposite sides of the same coin. That mm. when you are mentally in a position where you can no longer take it, you will turn that you will turn you will turn that violence that comes up outward or inward mm -hmm. and that we treat outward turning of violence as criminal but we treat in recent years because we used to treat suicide as a crime but we turn we treat that inward chain turning of violence as um, uh, as mental as a mental health issue but you know i mean you've raised black boys right you know you know what it is to to get a bo a, a young black man it's, on his way it is very difficult it's very i can't tell you the numbers of interventions i've had to have with my kids and one of the things that makes me sad about raising them in a segregated society uh and i think about this a lot that as a black girl raised in the south it wasn't until my teen years that i really had to deal with uh racism and white people's racism 
because I was in a segregated community and I didn't get to go in the white community and they didn't come in ours, pretty much. And so I, as a young child, six, seven, four, five, six, seven, and eight years old, I didn't have to deal with white people for the most part. My kids started dealing with them as three and started having problems at that age and has had constant problems uh, one way or the other that, uh, yeah, so. And, and while we're out of time for today, I, I think I wanna thank all of you for putting it really clearly and vividly and intensely in front of us that when you take away and you limit choice and opportunity, whether it's educational or voting or employment or economic or health or any other kind, you can only do that by dehumanizing the people you're doing that to. We owe each other better. And thank you all for bringing the spirit of MLK Jr. back and your own spirit and your own leadership in ways that remind us we have to humanize each other. Thank you all. Thank you. See you all Thank in a couple of weeks. All right. Bye. Come back and bye join. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Yeah.